My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can write a review for it on iTunes or you can simply make a donation. Those are perhaps the two best ways to express your support. Today, my guest on the show is Peter Voss. Peter is an entrepreneur, inventor, engineer, scientist, and an AI researcher. And I'm very happy to have him on the show. So, hi, Peter, and welcome to Singularity One on One. Hi. Um, yeah, good to be on the show. Fantastic. So, Peter, let me open up our interview with the first question, which is basically usually the same, and that is, can you please introduce yourself and what you do in a few words for those of our viewers who may not be familiar with you? Yeah, sure. Um, I started off um, in electronics, um, and um, when microcomputers appeared on the scene, I fell in love with programming, so I moved over from designing um, electronic circuitry to designing software primarily. I then started a, a company uh, to develop accounting systems for small businesses, and um, we did rather well, uh, providing complete solutions, hardware, software, training, everything. Um, and the company got uh, listed on stock exchange in, in South Africa, where I was living at the time. And um, that uh, enabled me to sort of retire from that business, selling my, my interest in that, in that company, uh, to pursue artificial intelligence, because something that had always bothered me in working with computers is how stupid and how brittle they are, uh, you know, software uh, programs generally, and um, really wanted to dedicate myself to understanding how humans think and how we can deal with such a variety of, of issues, deal with them so flexibly. Um, of course, also understanding the limitations of, of, of human thought and reasoning. So I, I spent probably about six or seven years just educating myself in um, many fields related to artificial intelligence um, or artificial general intelligence, uh, in, including a theory of knowledge, um, uh, psychometric testing, you know, how, how can we, uh, how do we actually know what people's intelligence is, what are the components, how reasonable are those, uh, cognitive science in general, uh, theory of knowledge, uh, and of course, computer science, uh, previous attempts in AI. So I spent quite a lot of, as so many years studying that and coming up with some ideas on how, how we can build intelligent machines. And for the last 14 years, I've uh, basically been running a company, a research company, um, uh, to make that happen, to uh, build various prototypes and explore things and to ultimately build machines that can really think and reason more like humans. And why? What was that motivation or that impetus that gave you that direction of, you know, retiring from one successful business and jumping into a completely different field, which, you know, many people have failed in for the last 50 years, perhaps? Right. Well, it's a combination of things. Uh, actually, my, my background in electronics and sort of, you know, uh, dynamic systems and electronics, uh, analog systems and feedback systems uh, combined with my experience in uh, um, programming, um, writing software, developing languages and all of that um, actually gave me a very good background to, to say, well, I can, I can see how some of these things are uh, similar to what we humans do in our cognition and our thinking and problem solving, but I can also see how it is different. And, um, you know, it's just a, a, an enormous, exciting challenge. Um, and it was sort of a combination of having confidence that I could contribute to the field and, and this, you know, just in, incredibly exciting field to be, be working, working in. I mean, it's, uh, you know, one of the grand challenges to be working on. So to, to feel well equipped to, to be able to work in that field and, and just the, the sheer excitement of, of uh, pursuing this, this dream, uh, as you say, people have been trying for 50 years and I'm sure we'll come around to talking about why we think it's different now. Yeah. Um, so sure. it, it was really kind of a no brainer. Just, you know, it's uh, in fact, what, what's driving me as a person is very much um, fulfilling my potential, you know, sort of what, what do I think I'm 
I'm good at, what, what will optimize my abilities in my life, and this seems to fit uh, very well. You've mentioned the excitement of working on one of the grand challenges. Uh, so, so share with us that vision about that ultimate dream, the biggest dream that you have, and, and how your motivation perhaps fits within that vision of your biggest dream. Right. Well, um, there, there are multiple dimensions there. The one is, you know, I, I'll be, be quite honest, is, is personal satisfaction and motivation. I mean, just working at, at, at a hard problem and making progress is just incredibly satisfying. So that's definitely a sort of a fundamental uh, driving uh, force. But, but also, you know, having studied philosophy and ethics uh, quite a lot, I do have some very strong views of what I believe human flourishing is all about. And uh, I think one of the key limitations we have as humans uh, is, in fact, our lack of rationality. I mean, we are rational animals, the rational animal, but uh, rationality is, is, is lacking in many ways, as you know, it's very obvious just looking around ourselves, looking at the headlines and news. Um, so I, I believe for, 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 for mankind to flourish, um, we do, in, in, in fact, need more intelligent systems to help us, uh, help guide us, make decisions, help solve the, you know, the other difficult problems that we have, such as energy and resource uh, limitations, good ways of um, uh, arranging societies, governing societies, um, all of those things, we seem to, we could certainly use a lot of help in that. And I think intelligent systems can, can help us uh, uh, achieve that. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you believe that we are rational animals. Uh, I don't want to dispute that at all, uh, or perhaps just a little bit. I mean, uh, and you can do that in many ways, but perhaps one way as a philosopher myself I would do is that, interestingly enough, a person like Aristotle himself didn't call humans uh, to be rational animals, but rather social animals. Do you think that that was done for a reason? And how do you think that would play uh, on the sort of the primary motivation? Because perhaps there's a, a sort of a, a difference of the primary motivator of humanity between, say, the view that you just expressed and that by Aristotle. Right. Um, well, it depends on how you define social in that sense. I mean, clearly other animals are social. There are some animals that are, that are quite social. So I wouldn't take that as our distinguishing characteristic. Uh, so I'm not quite sure where that particular quote and what context that was, was said, but I would uh, disagree with that. I mean, what is a distinguishing characteristic uh, of, of humans is that we have the ability to form abstract concepts and think in an abstract way. And that's really the fun foundation of, of, of rationality. Um, so, so how do we explain the fact that when we look around the world, it doesn't seem to appear that way? I mean, we, we see rational conduct all over the place, don't we? Well, of course, we are still animals, you know, so our reptile brain is still in, in charge. And, and you know, let, let me clarify that. I'm, you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't want to make it sound that mm -hmm. our um, uh, automatic thought processes are sort of non-rational or non, uh, uh, our subconscious processes are, 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 are all bad. Uh, they, they clearly are necessary. So, you know, uh, there's this idea of fast thinking, slow thinking, and automatic subconscious uh, reasoning that we do, if, if I can call it reasoning, uh, versus uh, deliberate, abstract, and, and, and conscious uh, thought. And, and these two systems obviously interplay. We couldn't survive if, if we had to consider everything explicitly and um, rationally analyze every move we make, every word we, we speak. I mean, as we're having this conversation you know, uh, I don't know what percentage, 98 percent of our conversation is happening happening automatically, subconsciously, otherwise it couldn't be happening at the speed that it is. So so, so clearly um, the <clears throat> our, our automatic responses and that um, are, are totally essential to our cognition, but they are also largely driven by evolutionary forces which um, uh, and shaped by evolutionary forces, which of course, um, you know, involve uh, fear and protection and uh, 
you know, reproduction and, and food and, and all of those kinds of things. So there are many, um, uh, many inherent things that, are, that are, evolution didn't shape for us to be, uh, be able to solve high level problems, but, you know, rather to deal with survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. And how does then that sort of rational decision making framework that you describe fit within your work with respect to artificial in general intelligence? Um, do you mean, um, do we have, do we need such dual systems as well? Is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're alluding to? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I believe, I believe Is it so. something you use as, uh, yes. And one way of looking at the, the subconscious processes, uh, is to look at it as pattern recognition, um, pattern completion. So I think that is, you know, and that, that's obviously a well, well known, um, view of, of artificial intelligence. So a lot of uh, what makes um, any uh, brain capable, uh, you know, any uh, mammal, any animal brain or human brain very capable is our incredible ability to recognize patterns, to anticipate by completing uh, patterns. And then on the, in the human realm, um, we basically are able to have patterns of patterns so that we are able to form abstract concepts to to really you know any level uh, of very high abstraction such such as you know the concept of of freedom or marriage or government or uh, you know those kind of things which are very high level concepts so that we we need to have the foundation of this pattern recognition system and pattern uh, generalization system and then in, in, in humans, we basically come to where we attach um, words, language, where language comes into it. And we are able to access these, these patterns that have been stored through simple symbols. And, and that makes it extremely efficient for us to, to be able to redirect our, our pattern recognition machinery, as it were, uh, through the symbolic uh, activation and manipulation through language. And, um, and of course, we use that in internal dialogue as well, that we use language to direct our thought. Well, be besides pattern recognition, though, economists often talk about something else, which is crucial for the rational decision making uh, framework, and that is utility curves. Uh, each of us supposedly have certain sort of utility curve and there's a sort of an optimum course of pursuit to accomplish that utility curve. So uh, now uh, we can say perhaps that humanity is not behaving rationally when they fail to accomplish uh, the pursuit of those utility curves in the most optimal way. But how do we extract such utility curves for, a, for an artificial intelligence, given the fact that their whole sort of motivation, uh, in other words, the evolutionary baggage that we have, which sort of provides us an insight into our utility curves, would be lacking for the artificial intelligence. Therefore, we would have I think considerable trouble extracting such utility curves in order to map out such behavior, wouldn't we? Yeah, I'm not sure that I buy into this uh, idea of utility curves or utility functions uh, very much as far as humans go. Uh, I'm not denying that, that that is one way of, of looking at it, but I'm not sure that it's very productive. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, humans are driven uh, driven more by you know certain basic drives, which which is more sort of bottom up that we behave in a certain way. The Maslow we hierarchy. Were, yes, I think uh, I think that that is certainly a, a I think a useful model um, uh, to to approach. But on a on a day to day basis, it's it, it's basically our automated responses that drive us, not not specifically goal directed behavior. I think we'd be much better at achieving our goals if, in fact, we did. Um, you know, if we had strong mechanisms built in to be goal oriented. In, in, a, in, in a sort of uh, overall life uh, optimizing way, which I don't think we, we are. I mean, obviously people can be goal driven in, in very specific things, but uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's true generally. So coming to AI, um, unless we specifically design an AI with those common drives of you know, either self-protection self or reproduction or increasing intelligence or something like that, um, they, 
um, you know, they'll, they'll be designed obviously to achieve some purpose. And the, the most obvious purpose is whatever purpose we give to them. And as an AGI, artificial general intelligence, that purpose will, will change. We'll give them different tasks. So, you know, today it might be arranging my travel schedule. Tomorrow it might be curing cancer. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I would see that um, no, no real point uh, in building in these sort of emotional drives in, into an artificial general intelligence. Um, hopefully we won't get, uh, you know, the military to get there first and somebody decides it'd be a good idea to build in, you know, some strong protective drives. But However, why wouldn't we get the military to build them first? I mean, they're the guys with the deepest pockets in the, more, in the moment, aren't they? They're the guys who are pretty much paying for the research. They, they are the guys who pretty much paid for the research in the 70s and the 80s and, and the 60s. Well, but then you also note that they're not, they're not actually, they don't seem to have come, uh, been able to actually utilize a lot of that technology. I mean, it ended up Apple giving it away, you know, in, in, in Siri. So maybe they couldn't quite figure out how to, to get that to work. So. I think, I'd, and that's true for autonomous cars and things. I mean, we see Google spearheading it. So maybe, maybe you need to have more of a, of a focus than, than uh, the military has. You know, they have all these little, little projects, but then, you know, the, the head of that project moves on and then somebody else has different ideas and they, they seem to be trying lots of different things, but I'm, I'm not sure that there is enough of a, a coherent vision and, and the kind of longer term dedicated vision that you um, that you tend to to get in you know individuals and individuals running companies but absolutely there's there's a risk that the military will um, will uh, use AI first and that it will do it in a, in a way that is suboptimal however having said that I, I also have a very strong uh, sense and idea that um, AI is somewhat self-correcting, AGI is self-correcting. And here I'm sort of going head to head with a whole uh, friendly AI theory and, 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 and that kind of thing is that um, to put it, to put it uh, sort of simply is the more intelligent the system is, the, the more moral it is. And obviously that's a strong statement and I don't, I don't claim to say that it's true under all circumstances, but I'm, um, um, uh, I am claiming that there, there seems to be a general trend. So if the military built in uh, basic animal drives in, for survival and things like that, I think it would be at the expense of making good decisions, uh, um, you know, that, that inherently systems driven, uh, driven by base motivations uh, end up being less intelligent and ultimately less capable. And, and, you know, I think that's sort of in a simple, simplistic way, that is why we dominate over animals, you know, that are lot, much stronger than, than, than we are because they may just, they just work according to survival instincts, mm -hmm. whereas we can outthink them. Yeah. Peter, there's a number of things that I want us to bite in here and, and jump uh, sort of into the meat of the matter. But but before that, I want to ask a couple of still general questions, and then we, we're, we're going to zoom in. So, so first of all, let me ask you a little bit about the importance of philosophy and ethics in particular with respect to your work. How is that coming into play, and where does this originate from? Right. So in terms of philosophy, I've, um, I've always, uh, you know, sort of from childhood, uh, admired philosophers without really understanding what they what they do it sort of just seemed wow these are the, the really smart guys and you know asking and answering all the big questions and then when i i finally got a got a chance uh, in, in life to actually study philosophy extensively you know spend a lot of time reading it um i was incredibly disappointed i you know i said is this the best we've come up with in two or three thousand years <laughs> um, you know, that uh, with all due respect that Aristotle is still the guy we ho hold up, you know, as, as a reference point, uh, come on, you know, we should have uh, moved on. And, you know, philosophy, I find it just uh, the, the mainstream philosophy, I find just extreme, extremely disappointing. You pick up a philosophy book today and usually in the introduction says, well, we don't really know what philosophy is, but anyway, here's another 800 pages of, you know, 
talking about philosophy, but we don't know what it what it really means, you know. And love they, of they wisdom, seem of to, course. What's that? Love of wisdom, of course. Uh, yeah, and and they they don't seem. It always seems to be philosophy is about debating different points of view and looking at the history. And to me, that seems just such a waste of time, you know. Clearly, there are a lot of things that we have figured out and that we should say, no, we don't have to bother going over those old tired arguments again. We know we know who's right. We know who's wrong. So let's let's move on. And, you know, um, so I, I found that very, uh, very disappointing. And, uh, you know, like free will, for example, to me, you know, that's a solved problem. Consciousness is is pretty much a solved problem. Um, Those okay, are all here, revelations I'm, I'm, to me. I have to admit. He, he, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Here, I'm obviously jumping into the, the, the deep end of uh, <laughs> of AI philosophy, but even more mundane um, sort of uh, philosophy. You know that I, I mean, one of my uh, one of the philosophers that I thought um, was pretty good was Bertrand Russell. I, I like him in particular. Mm, I like him too. Uh, that he wasn't shy to 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 ch fundamentally change his mind. You know, over his whole lifetime, he he would you know he would write a book in his thirties, uh, making a very compelling argument for something, and then twenty years later, he'd write a book telling us why that was all wrong and garbage, and and you know, and, and he didn't do that to play games. He, he really did that as he as his philosophical vision. Uh, uh, changed and improved, you know, and debating his, his views with other people. And you know, but doesn't that go exactly in opposition to what you just said about finding answers and not having to debate them again? Because if he were the kind of guy who assumed that he has found the answer 30 years ago and he just had to move on and find a more productive usage of his time, then he would have never reconsidered it and he would have never changed his mind. So is, isn't that what it's all about in, in some ways, right? It's about, it's, I, I'm actually just about to publish an article on my blog that it's about the questions actually, not about the answers. Mm. Okay. No, I would still disagree in, in the sense that there are fundamental questions that we, we know about. I mean, the, you know, the relationship between knowledge and existence and, uh, and that I mean, those you know, primacy of of uh, you know the primacy of consciousness is has to be garbage, you know. And sure, I mean, people can uh, can come up with new arguments, and and if somebody has a, a strong enough argument, you revisit your views, but you don't constantly, uh, you know, uh, sort of act in a, in a way as if you have no no improvement in knowledge, as you, as as if you know your your knowledge doesn't actually move forward. Uh, your knowledge base that there are, are certain things mm -hmm. um, so uh, but yeah it, it's obviously that by itself is a big big topic uh, yeah and philosophy not and philosophy, digress yeah. into a philosophical debate here yeah so. you you did you did ask me how that how that influenced and i got, yeah. got a little, little sidetracked so mm -hmm. I, I found studying philosophy in um, in, in different areas you know and i Having to understand what is knowledge in the, in the first place, so epistemology, yeah. how do we know anything? So I, I had to really go back to the basics of what is reality? Is it knowable? Is there such a thing as my reality and your reality and what does it mean? And, um, you know, no, there is one reality out there and there's my perception of that reality and there's your perception of reality, but it's not my reality and your re reality. That's just a, a shorthand. So this would be a good example of where I think we should just move on, you know, that people would still debate and waste time about saying, Descartes. well, there's my reality and your reality. No, no, it's my perception of reality and your perception of reality, but the reality is the reality that's out there. Uh, so... And um, uh, I, I, I know it's not it's it's uh, it's not going to endear me to a lot of people, but I um, I learned uh, a lot from Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. So I'm actually a great fan of hers. Um, not saying that she got everything right, but uh, uh, she she did uh, address a number of those kind of problems. I think uh, really really well. Uh, she also, I think, addressed the problem of, of what is right and wrong, which even Bertrand Russell, I think, in his last book that he wrote in his 90s, he said, you know, all my philosophy, I, I never actually managed to sort out how we know what is right or wrong. He didn't even know how to begin to do that, which I found really astonishing after, you know, such a brilliant man spending a lifetime pursuing philosophy. Doesn't that say something, though? Because I, I, I see the world more like Bertrand. 
and and very much not like Ayn Rand. Well, uh, you know, if we ever have the time to debate it, maybe I could convince you that uh, that um, there is actually a very uh, coherent uh, answer for you know how we know right and wrong. Um, I don't have time to go into that now. Okay. So, uh, so, you, uh, so you know, these these insights of uh, basically how do we acquire knowledge? What is knowledge? How does what's a relationship to reality? Um, it was very important for me to be able to design AI systems. So the, it, I found that uh, you know, and and continue to find it a really strong and important reference point. So does that mean that in a way that your AI systems would tend to carry the sort of the objectivist flavor, if you will, or 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 biases, or or I don't want to say bias is not a good word, but uh, <laughs> yes, I would agree that's not what objectivism is supposed to be about. Yeah. Right? So yes, one would need to separate, and and I do want to make this this point. You know, as people will will watch that is. Uh, I think the um, the objectivist movement, as such, I, th I think, is deeply flawed. Um, I would agree on that <laughs> in, in 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 many ways, and uh, even I'd go as far as to say, or I won't say as far as to say, I would make the point that Ayn Rand wasn't a very good objectivist, uh, which which is kind of an in interesting point and, and statement to to make if the founder of a philosophy, just uh, like Karl you know, Marx, was not a very good Marxist. That's been made over and over again right so it's it's really more i mean objectivism is about um, finding the truth about reality and you know as that as that that's what objectivism means it's not that there is some absolute truth that you that is to be found in ayn rand's books it's a it's an approach towards achieving knowledge of reality uh -huh. peter tell us a little bit more about uh your companies what sure. what they what are they called and what's the sort of the the business goals in front of those companies? Right. So um, as I said, I, I spent you know six or seven years studying artificial intelligence and related uh, related fields, um, including biological you know uh, sub structures of our you know, of how our brains work. And um, about it's now of what 14, 13, 14 years ago. I started the, the first research company called Adaptive AI, uh, or A2I2, mm -hmm. um, and that was a pure R&D company to, to basically implement some of the, uh, the ideas that I'd accumulated, uh, build prototypes, experiment, and, and so on. And uh, this was at a dot-com uh, bust uh, around about that time, 2001, uh, when I was actually fortunate to find quite a few uh, smart programmers out there who had you know, made some money in the dot-com bubble, but lost their jobs when their companies imploded or, you know, and, and so we, we had a team of about six, seven, eight people very quickly that could work for, you know, that they, they were just looking for something interesting to do. So that's how we got off the ground and we, we built um, uh, a development framework, basically uh, the, the fundamental brain structure, a virtual world. So we had this little critter. Uh, that would live in this virtual world, and it, it had virtual whiskers and ears and nose, and you know it could sense the environment in different ways. and And we taught it to to do different things in this environment. And so we progressed. We then, you know, this this critter went from sort of a, a mouse level to a, a dog level, where we started giving it instructions. And so we did that kind of uh, uh, work for, for about six, six years or so, culminating in actually, interestingly enough, a, a virtual assistant, uh, personal assistant, because we moved increasingly towards language-based uh, training. Because once we got the dog level, we said, okay, fetch. And then we kind of realized, well, if we could give this dog more comprehensive commands, uh, that would actually help our training and, you know, it would make it easier for us to to deal with and communicate with that. And so, and of course, it's no longer a dog. Now it was a baby. So now we went through the Piagetian development stages and, and we built systems doing that. We spent about um, a year and a half or so uh, working through that. And then we actually ended up with a personal assistant that could go uh, could go onto the Internet and buy something on eBay or book a flight and do things like that. So we had this this great personal assistant prototype. Unfortunately, we didn't really know what how to commercialize it or what to do with it because um, you know it was just a prototype and would have taken you know 
uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to turn into commercial product. We didn't know that Apple was going to pay somebody $200 million for such technology, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, and of course, Apple still don't monetize it directly, you know, only in indirectly, so they don't charge people for Siri. So we had basically a Siri-like prototype, um, you know, that's about eight years ago now. But um, we then had to decide how to commercialize, what to do with the technology that we developed. And we started a, a company called Smart Action, um, which is now a standalone commercial company doing, doing rather well, where we automate phone calls. So, you know, when you call a company for support and you talk to a computer and you hate it, <laughs> okay, well, you'll love ours because they have some intelligence. So we use our artificial general intelligence engine, our language engine that we have developed uh, as the basis for developing this commercial product. So that's that company is a smart action. And basically that that starting up that company um, took over my life and then you know uh, uh, sucked me in for about five or six years and getting a company off the ground and and successfully running. And I've, I, I now handed that over about a year ago uh, to, to a CEO we hired. And uh, I just, you know, about six months ago, uh, formed a new AI research company, um, uh, AGI Innovations Inc., or AGI3. And uh, we now have a team of eight people in, in that company. And uh, we are back to doing pure R&D. That's all we, all we do to develop AGI technology, not but not not commercial, no commercial focus uh, that we can keep our minds on solving the real problems rather than being sidetracked uh, by what commercial requirements one has. Mm -hmm. So you're one of the very few people actually who's focusing research on artificial general intelligence. Correct. Yeah, uh, I, I know it's a bit. It, it, you know, I sort of think about and look around and say, well, who else is actually working on this full time? And, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with any sort of sizable teams because uh, certainly Google is as big as they are on Microsoft don't claim to be working on AGI. I mean, they, they, they don't think, um, you know, it's worth working on trying to tackle the whole project. So uh, looking around, it kind of surprises me that we may well be the biggest team in the world working full-time on AGI, which mm -hmm. is kind of scary, you know, when you think of a, a little uh, eight-person team trying to tackle this problem and hoping to make progress. <laughs> but, uh, but I do believe, um, you know, the, with the experience we gained in the first six years of our operation, of, of our R&D in seven, six, seven years, and with the work we're doing now, I, I do believe we are actually making some uh, very good progress and uh, moving, the, moving the state of the art forward and, AGI. So how far are we? I, I just watched before our interview, I watched a presentation of yours during the 2009 Singularity Summit, uh -huh. where you said that if you're pessimistic, you would say 10 years, and if you're optimistic, it could be as soon as five years. Mm -hmm. Well, we're about the halfway point now, so the five years have, right. or at least four and a half years to be more accurate, have passed. So within, we are within the fifth year. Right. So are you still sticking to that timeline? Well, I, th I think as other people in, uh, in you know, uh, AGI researchers are actually working on that, and I think Ben, ben Goertzel certainly has made similar statements. Um, I don't know if in that particular talk I made the, the, the caveat uh, that assuming that people are actually working on it. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, our team has had a hiatus uh, of, you know, six years basically where we're commercializing and we didn't do, we, we made zero progress on AGI during that, that period. So it's essentially time stood still as, as far as that goes. Um, so yes, given resources at the time when I said that, uh, I didn't know whether we would continue, I assumed that we would be able to continue uh, doing, doing research. So if I, if I think back now, if for the last six years we had continued doing AGI development, uh, we'd be in an amazing place, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, there's just, you know, the, having lost the six years in, in development is sort of like a real tragedy. But on the other hand, we are now in a position to to fund our R&D, you know, which which is just incredibly difficult to find How funding. How do you fund it? Well, it's 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 basically through um, through the commercial uh, venture 
through our commercial venture. Oh, so so in a way, is it fair to say that the narrow narrow AI funds the general AI? Yeah, yeah, sure, right. But uh, I, yeah, and and in fact, in fact, you smile at that. But uh, <laughs> um, any commercial uh, commercial product that you have right now, until you actually get close to human level AGI, you will be able to will always be able to do better with narrow AI. And, and it's something we realized right up front in our, in, our, uh, in our project that as soon as you try to zero and even on a particular demo for your AGI, you know, so you're trying to get funding for your AGI, so you, you produce a demo. So what you do is you end up putting a whole lot of, you know, you cheat. You basically put a whole lot of narrow AI in there to make the demo more, more impressive. And so as soon as you have a commercial product, um, you know, Siri as well, whatever its original wider uh, general intelligence ambitions were, they were very quickly stripped out uh, and same in our commercial product. So commercial product will always be narrow AI, when I say always, until we get close to uh, human level AGI. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, of course, you, to make money, narrow AI, don't try and make money with AGI um, mm -hmm. until you get way up there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would you care to revise your timeline and say that perhaps again we are still within that five to ten year range starting today? Well, I guess I'm a bit older and wiser. Um, I, I, you know, to to say that it can happen in five years uh, it would require a lot more resources than I see anybody uh, employing towards this. Now, it's possible, and, I, and you know, we're working very hard at it, that within a few years, we will have enough to show in our AGI research that we will be able to very significantly gear up. And I'm talking you know, about hundreds of people working on, on the project, which is certainly not uh, within our capabilities at this stage. So you know, can we get to a point within, say, three years from now where uh, we have enough to show to be able to get this massive influx of funding and, uh, and, and have a much bigger project. And could it happen in five years from now? Uh, yes, I wouldn't. I certainly would not rule that out uh, with what we have. Um, if uh, we and other teams continue, you know, work on, on this, if there were actually other teams uh, of, of any size working on AGI full-time, uh, could it happen in 10 years? Is it likely to happen in 10 years? I, I, I still believe that, so I haven't changed changed my mind on that on that at all uh, I think the resources required I, I certainly have revised that upwards so whereas I would have you know thought that uh, you could do it maybe with uh, you know get get to meaningful general intelligence with a few dozen people I, I think it'll require quite a lot more than that mm -hmm. you scaled um, up yeah, because yeah. in 2009, you were saying that at that point in time, we pretty much had all the elements uh, in your view, if I remember the talk. Yeah. And, and exactly, yeah. it was a matter of putting it together, which is a very complicated and complex matter, right? You stressed that, yes. but, but still right. you had the elements, yeah. right? So now you've changed your mind to the statement that... Uh, putting the elements together, I, I would say I still believe that the pieces of the puzzle are largely there. So uh, I think the, the statement I made then was some, something like uh, that I don't believe that fundamentally new technology needs yeah. to be in invented uh, to achieve AGI. And I would, I would still stand by that. I still believe that's, that's true. Now, of course, until you put you know, those pieces that I believe that are in place, until you start putting them together and actually seeing whether they'll, they'll cooperate and work with you, can integrate them in the way that you, you need to, or whether at that point you hit a brick wall. I mean, that's the nature of, of R&D. And then you have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, we hit a brick wall. How do we solve that problem? That's happened a few times in, in our project where something didn't work out the way expected to. And then, but the interesting thing is we've always found the solution up, uh, you know, relatively quickly within six months or, or, or a year or so. We found some way of, of, of becoming that. So, um, it's, you know, my assumption is that whatever problems come up, they, they don't seem to, in my mind, there aren't fundamentally um, huge mysteries, you know, that uh, it's, it's more of an engineering problem. In fact, our, our current company is much more of a development company than it's a research company. Or we in a, I should say we're in a development phase rather than research. We actually know what we need to do. If I had, you know, 10 times as many people, I could, you know, get 
uh, worth not 10 times as fast, but maybe three times as fast. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you this then. If somebody else were to beat you to, to the post, as if it were, and be the first to claim to have created an AGI, mm -hmm. how would you approach the evaluation of that statement, whether it's true or false? We spoke about the fact that reality exists out there beyond mm -hmm. us. How would your perception of that statement of them saying that would sort of be evaluated? How would you assess if it's true or false? Mm. Well, it, it you know it, it depends on what kind of AGI it is. You know, people have very very different approaches to that. But assuming it was some AGI somewhat similar to what we're doing, i.e., that it is, is language based, so you would expect it to you can talk to it. So you'd have some preliminary kind of you know Turing test, and I certainly don't think the Turing test is is um, you know is is that that meaningful for for various reasons. But um, certainly that would be a starting point. You know, if it doesn't, uh, if you can't have a conversation with it, you tell it something, you can ask it back in, a, in different words. Um, does it have understanding? Does it understand? Does it have a model of, of, of the world uh, in, in some way? Can you interact with it? Uh, then other tests would be, can you teach it to play a game that it's never seen, seen before? Um, you know, the same way you could teach any other eight-year-old or something, a new game. Hey, let's let's invent a new game, um, a, a new language. You know, so it would be tests like that. Would and and at the moment, I mean, we have nothing out there that can come anywhere close to. Let me uh, propose. Doing that. Let me propose a small feature within that sort of dialogue mm -hmm. that you're going to have. I would say I would posit myself that you have to look for the ability to ask questions because I would say that. Asking question is a fundamental part of the learning process. And until that machine is able to ask very good questions in its own right, it will not be able to proceed by learning on its own. I mean, Pablo Picasso famously said that computers are useless. They can only give you answers. So, so in other words, for me, one big part of the Turing test would be, can that machine ask you reasonable, very good, important questions and build upon the answers? Because it's an ongoing process. It's not about a specific question or a specific answer, but it's about that process. Right. Yes, I think you're quite right. Uh, I mean, to me, we wouldn't really talk about what what I think intelligence is or what an AGI needs to be able to do, but uh, learning, you, you use that word, I think is, uh, is is key to it. The system needs to be able to learn interactively. And part of learning is, of course, asking questions or hitting the books, you know, that you, you get some piece of information and it's ambiguous or it's contradictory and you need clarification, you need to z drill in. And absolutely, the uh, an, an AGI system absolutely needs to be able to to do that is to identify gaps in its knowledge contradictions uh ambiguity and have met methods mechanisms for you know resolving those and, and filling them in and we we actually in our own project we have a list of um 14 different ways in which uh, our agi needs to acquire knowledge um, so um, you know yes that that is absolutely key mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, time is advancing here, so we have only probably just a few minutes left. Uh, let me let me just ask you this: uh, How do you view books like James Barrett's recent book about uh, our final invention, for example, which is very much supported by MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Re Research Institute, in their claim that by definition any AI which lacks the friendliness feature as part of its design would be a threat to humanity, perhaps an existential threat. Right. So uh, I certainly disagree strongly with the, with the view that any AGI, any system that has human level intelligence is inherently um, going to, you know, lead to to just lead to the destruction of, of humanity or whatever. I mean, that's certainly one of the stronger views that has been ex expressed that of all the minds you can build, 
the chances of building a mind that will not destroy uh, humanity, you know, are, are tiny. Uh, I, I think that is nonsense. Uh, to me, the sort of paper clip arguments and those, I, I just find them quite ridiculous. And I, th I think they've been debunked. You know, any system um, that has human level intelligence, uh, by definition, will need to understand that, uh, no, we, do we don't want uh, the universe, you know, converted into paper clips. So, um, <laughs> uh, so know, how do you prevent that? I mean, don't you feel like you might be working towards the end of the world in a way, according to those people's arguments, if you succeed, you right. might be a fundamental existential threat to humanity. Right. So, so first of all, I, 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 you know, as I, as I mentioned now, I do not agree that um, an AI is inherently likely to destroy the world. So, you know, that in fact, I have somewhat the opposite view that it's more, much more likely to be inherently friendly. And I alluded to that earlier, where I said that there, there is a correlation, an important correlation between intelligence uh, and um, morality. Let's unpack that a little bit, because I don't understand it, perhaps. Okay. Um, you know, I know whenever I have this de debate, it's not one that is settled in, uh, in three minutes or five minutes. But le let me give you just sort of a taste of where, sure. you know, where I look for um, how, how presented. So I, I think by now, most people in America um, believe that um, going to Iraq was was not a good was not a good thing, was not moral and wasn't very smart. I hope so. Yeah. So. Uh, however, I, I was shocked and surprised that at the time, uh, Americans were almost, of, of both political persuasions were almost unanimous in Can't thinking call. it was a good idea, which I, uh, you know. So uh, let's assume we have an AI that, that actually is rational and we've come to respect its opinion because it has been, it's given us good advice as like an oracle, you know, that we've asked yeah. it to give us good advice and told us, no, you better not get married here, or yes, you should get married, or you shouldn't invest in the scam, or, you know, whatever. It's basically given us some good advice along the line. So we now ask this oracle, do we think um, it's a good idea that we, we go to Iraq? And it's available to many people, uh, and it will tell us in many different ways why this is not a good idea. And it will also know what we're actually trying to achieve. You know, are we trying to secure our supply of oil? Is that what it is? This, uh, that's the reason. Okay. And it might suggest other ways in which we can solve our energy problems because, you know, it's smart and methodical and logical. And it can give us these reasons um, because doing immoral things are often things that are done uh, for lack of knowledge or out of fear. And if you could have uh, a, a rational, you know, oracle, a rational system that can help you find better solutions to that, then that is also inherently a, a, a moral thing. So that's basically where I see the, the correlation between intelligence, having better solutions, being able to overcome your, your fear um, that leads to better outcomes and therefore better morality. Let me try to attack this a little bit here. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Your key pivotal word that you use is often. So mm -hmm. intelligent intelligence often would help us do that. And in this particular case that you mentioned, I would agree with you entirely. I would hope so that it would play out like this. And I would say it's probably plausible scenario. However, is it hard to deny that there are situations in which uh, being evil pays out completely. Uh, and I can give you many examples, like not like Iraq, but for example, let's say um, in colonial times, we go to a certain island where there are certain kind of natural resources. The difference between us and the local, quote, savages, end of quote, is, you know, let's say, gargantuan in terms of technology and capabilities. So we have several options. One is to engage in trade, which they don't understand the concept of. Another is to simply exterminate them and do that in the most efficient and effective manner. So I would like to propose to you that actually, if you have that kind of high intelligence and high capacity, yes, perhaps the quantity of your 
evil deeds would diminish as quantity, but the quality of those few ones where it would be the best, most optimal course of action with respect to accomplishing a certain goal would be so bad that the negative effect overall might be still negative. And it still would not be uh, precluded from happening. Right. So, first of all, we, we would need to separate out whether we believe the AI has its own motivation. And I don't think we're talking about that case here. I think we're talking about the case where the AI is, uh, does not have its own motivation, uh, but where it advises us. And so, if, you know, if it ad advised, say, um, uh, a government or, you know, Bill Gates or somebody, well, evil Bill Gates, I don't know, some people believe that. I actually like him personally, but... Yeah, so, but, yeah, well, of course, he's a philanthropist now, so he's, uh, you know, uh, but, but, but anyway, let, let's, uh, let's, let's, well, let me not put a name on it, but let, let's say there's some billionaire who's, who's evil and he has access to this AGI that'll give him advice. If there was such asymmetry, I, I certainly think that, in, you know, an, an AI uh, could uh, could be used for, for negative things to some extent. But even there, and, and I do want to refer back to Ayn Rand because she actually did an extremely, extremely good job at unpacking that. You know, when people uh, said, and, and she gave some very good examples of um, why it is not inherently good for yourself to be lying to people and to be cheating people. And I don't really if have If you're the, time. the lion in the jungle, it it doesn't yeah, matter. Well, we, you can well, kill right. and do whatever you want. Right, exactly. That's exactly the point. We are not lions in the jungle. You know, you, you, you can't take that just at an abstract level. You have to take it for yourself. So um, imagine you're, you, you, made, you can make your money by cheating people. And, you know, you have found some way of hacking into a bank and, and, and getting money. Will that lead you to happiness? Will that, is that inherently compatible with human happiness? And uh, the answer is no, it is not, because what do people want? They also want to be respected in society. They want to have a family. They want to have, you know, a life partner for most people. They want to have children for many people. So if you made your money that way, what kind of person are you going to be able to attract as your life partner? So either you, you're not going to tell them how you made your money, in which case, what kind of relationship do you have if you can't even talk about what, you know, you do for a living, as it were? Or you attract somebody uh, who isn't, you know, who you also can't trust because if they think it's cool to just do people in, then, you know, they're either just going to be a slave to you because you're so powerful or it's somebody that you, you're never ever going to be able to trust because they think it's, you know, it's just fine to, to rip somebody off. How do, you, how do you tell your children what you do? How do you raise your children? How do you look Very yourself easy, in the mirror? Actually. Very easy. I mean, look at history, like people traded other people and were slave owners of thousands of people and they created the hierarchical justification simply by saying those are savages. And that's why I said that it has to have that discrepancy, ideological and philosophical discrepancy, right? We got, that's why I said, with, I, I get the Ayn Rand argument within a certain context of, let's say, us here today in America. But, well, that's, you, what, but that's where we are. So you, but, you not, but that's not the world. The world is a lot more complicated than this, right? Look at Ukraine, look at everywhere, right? There's a huge sure, discrepancy but, but, of power. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've also read the books on how everything is getting better. I mean, I actually just had a letter salon uh, last Sunday where we spoke about that and I had a stack of books and, and graphs and showing how really everything is getting better. I mean, in, in, in every measure, you know, if, uh, obviously there are blips along, uh, along the line, but I mean, you, you look at individual freedom, you look at, you know, uh, democracy, you look at, you know, uh, longevity, wealth, every, everything. And on, on every measure, humanity is, is moving in the right direction as a, as a general trend. Well, that's, a, that's a little bit different topic. My, my point here was that there are circumstances, as there have been historically circumstances in which Oh uh, yes, yes, sure. It and pays isolated, to be evil in, anymore. In, in isolated cases, but you know, I'm I'm assuming that AGI technology, as it becomes comes about, will be available to many people, and certainly that's something that uh, I would uh, push to 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 achieve. It seems the, the natural way that it should help us and it should help as many people as possible. 
Well, well, Peter, I, I truly, I truly hope that that's the case, and and I've actually kept you here longer than than I promised I would. So let me ask you quickly the last two questions in the last two minutes. So first of all, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Uh, just if you Google my name, you'll probably find it very quickly. Just Peter Boss B O S S, and um, yeah, I you know a bunch of different things i'm also very interested in life extension calorie restriction and cryonics and um, yeah, philosophy i've written about uh, free will so if anybody's in interested in that I, I have a fairly lengthy article on that mm -hmm. but yeah typically if you put a keyword in my name and you know, the chances are you'll you'll get to it pretty quickly I would have to admit, I would love to, to have the unique opportunity to sit down with you one night over dinner or over a glass of wine and just have a three or four hour long discourse about many philosophical issues. I think it will be a fantastic event. But in the meantime, what's the most important message that you would like to leave us with today? The one single most important thing that we should take from this conversation with you today? Um, well, <laughs> you know, I'm not into the sort of one-line advertising, really. <laughs> really, otherwise I maybe would have taken a different career. But um, in that in intelligence and morality, that having more intelligence will be good for, for mankind. Fantastic. Peter Voss, thank you very much for your time today. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And yes, let's get together and, and have that debate sometime. Huh? Looking forward to it.